Siapakah mualaf kita kali ini? Seperti apa latar belakangnya? Angela Tammy Kepler is a born and raised Texan who loves sports and the outdoors. I grew up playing basketball on basketball team and volleyball teams and running the mile. Enjoyed writing poetry, drawing. I even won an art competition when I was in high school. My parents divorced when I was five. My father remarried to my stepmother when I was 10. Environment I grew up in school and church and things like this. You have a responsibility. You need to give back. You need to make a difference. So that's what I strove for. I had the opportunity to see two different types of Christianity. One my father had chosen when he was a teenager. And when I was a teenager, I went to live with my mom and I saw another type of Christianity in the Baptist church, Protestant mentality with the Trinity and celebration of Christmas and things like this. That gave me a different perspective. I got benefit from both churches, but I was still a person in search of something more. How was your life in regards to faith? Did you have any faith before? I had faith. Fortunately, I was raised in, like I said, my father's chosen church, and that one was very disciplined. I had always been in a religious environment. When my mother found this church too rigid, she decided not to go anymore. But because I'd been raised in my father's church, there was a very distinct difference. In my father's church, for example, they focused a lot on the first commandment of Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. In my dad's church, they had done a lot of research, and in that research they found that most of the holidays that are celebrated in America have some sort of paganistic background. Or even there's verses in the Bible that speak against the different aspects of those holidays. For example, in my dad's church, we didn't celebrate Christmas because first of all, the verses of the Bible indicate that Jesus wasn't born that time of year. So that's not his birthday, December 25th. And second, there's uh, verses in the Bible in Jeremiah indicate that the decoration of the tree was actually a paganistic behavior. They used to celebrate with decorating it with silver and gold and worshiping the spirit in the tree. We're supposed to believe only in God and not worship anything else. And they made that very clear. We didn't even celebrate birthdays. There would be a cake with candles and you light the candles and you make a wish, but your wishes are supposed to be turned to God, the one who can provide. My dad's church, we realized that this is like fire worship. So yeah, I had faith, but it wasn't enough. I didn't know the name of my Lord that it's Allah. I didn't know exactly how he wanted me to worship him, or, but I didn't know it at the time. There were indications of it in my dreams because I was having nightmares. I was not at peace with where I was. I didn't feel safe, especially as a teen. That search became deeper and deeper because the feeling became more and more unsettling. It's like, okay, what's the truth? Where are the answers? One time I thought, okay, Get out your legal pad, you're in debate, find the answers, you know, search out, research what the truth is. So I got out my yellow legal pad and I wrote my questions and made an appointment with my mom's minister and went to the church, entered this very luxurious dark green leather and rich brown wood and it's like, okay, did I just enter an attorney's office or what, you know? Yeah, it was a big church, but I was expecting something more humble, something more modest. Anyway, so I sat down in the big leather chair right in front of his massive wooden desk. And so I started asking my questions. I said, you know, I've had this experience in my father's church and I'm seeing this in your church. So why the differences? You're using the same book. You both say you're Christians. So why the difference? You know, why do you celebrate Christmas? Why do you eat pork? He gave me some answers, but where he got his answers, I couldn't determine. Was it his own thoughts? Uh, was it the church organization's thoughts or, you know, something he had learned in theology school? Whatever his answers were, they were insufficient because they did, he didn't open up the book, the, the Bible, and say, here's the answer. It left me very unsettled. So I let him finish. I left the meeting rather disappointed. And so I stopped going to church and tried to fill my life with other things. Like I said, I was on sports teams and I was studying anyway, and I was interested in, you know, art drawing and uh, poetry and stuff like that, but it wasn't working. You know, I was still feeling empty. I was still feeling lost. I was still feeling fear. So I thought, okay, I know there's a God. I know there were prophets. I know that he sent books, but I didn't know what that was. So I started praying, oh God, give me wisdom. You know, I wanted guidance. I wanted to know what the truth was and how to apply it. So I thought, okay, I need to find somewhere to enrich my soul. 
because on my own, it's not enough. Yes, prayer, supplication, you know, morning and night, oh God, give me wisdom, was something, but it wasn't enough. I had gone to the church that my mom had chosen, the Baptist church in the town, which was half an hour away from where I went to university. So I went there and I found people inspired by the love of God, especially their appreciation for Jesus was evident. And you know, their care for one another, their smiling faces, their kind words, their helpful nature, this was all very appealing. And so I thought, okay, let me give that church a try. And so I started going on Sundays to this church, which was on the other side of town. It's a huge church. One of the things I liked about it was that there were no images in the church. But after going a few times, I began to realize, yeah, again, this is not what I'm looking for. This is not what's going to fulfill me. But at least I'm in an environment that's reminding me of God and that is helping me to learn some of the words of the Bible that are inspiring and fulfilling and things like that. Time went on and my prayer was continuing. It turns out God was going to send me some help. I had a mutual friend at the university I was going to who had also been going to the student center on campus and his name was Rome. Rome had a friend, interestingly, was different. He was Turkish and a Muslim, but he decided to come to the church to see what it was like. I knew for sure that Rome was trying to help him become a Christian what this person's intentions were in coming to the church, I wasn't sure. But when I met him, I was intrigued by something that he did. And that was, we went on a canoe trip, a youth activity for the church. We went on a canoe trip. When we stopped for lunch, he asked which one of the meals didn't have any pork in them. And I thought, oh, that's interesting because I still was not eating pork out of my beliefs that I had learned from my father's church. And so I thought, wow, that's interesting. You know, why is he not eating pork? And he said something about like, it's part of my religion. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. This person turned out to be very helpful in my search, an instrument that God was using to help me. When I encountered this person in 1991, and he started bringing me little brochures from the mosque, about the basics of Islam. Interestingly, I found a lot of similarity in these things with the things that I'd learned in my father's church. He brought me another brochure. This one was about a book named the Quran. And this book was only God's words. The words were only his. With the Bible, it's unclear who the authors of the chapters are, whose words are written there, whereas the Quran, the whole thing, is God's words. And I found that very profound. A book that's flawless, a book that's only God's words, and it's promised to be protected till the end of time. Because by the way, the world's last prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, he was the one that received it. It can't be his words because he was an illiterate man and had no knowledge of the previous religions. This was pure revelation and that inspired me. We're talking about 1991, no internet, almost no access to anything about Islam in English. I was blessed with a tiny book that this person had found in our university library, seven floors of books, and he found this book, Imam Nebuwi's 40 Hadith. And this tiny book, it took us two nights to read it because it wasn't just read it and go on. It was something that you read and you have to go, huh, I had just found the answer. What God wanted from me, it told me who my God was, it was Allah. It told me what religion He had chosen for me. It told me little things about how to live my life in the best way. And that's completely true. That's the difference between wise words and the words of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Hadith and the verses of the Quran. Because in the Hadith and the Quran, it's completely true. It's fully comprehensive because it is provided to us, this religion and the teachings in it are provided to us by the one who knows everything, the all-knowing. And fortunately in Christianity, I had learned this name, the all-knowing, but I hadn't been exposed to that knowledge completely until I found Islam. So needless to say, inspired by this knowledge and this ever increasing knowledge of this way of life that's so complete it remedies all the world's problems or it can if it's properly applied. I was so inspired that 
Shortly after that, I became Muslim. Bagaimana keadaanmu setelah masuk Islam? Honestly, I don't remember how I first heard about Islam. Maybe it was my world history teachers standing in front of the class, so excited, explaining Miss Williams. I still remember, she was so excited. She's standing in the front of the class and she goes, these people wash themselves five times a day. She's talking about the abolition that Muslims take before prayer. But I knew nothing about Islam, didn't even know the word as it was a religion rather than maybe a person who was practicing it or whatever. I mean, so clueless. But I remember her excitement. And later when I became Muslim, I thought she was talking about the abolition before prayer. You know, that's awesome. There were these hints of exposure, but I lived in Texas in the Bible Belt. I mean, pretty much every neighborhood had a little bitty church. Going to church was a crucial part of my upbringing. I was not exposed to any Muslim in the strangest places where those beginnings were. Like at this film I watched, it was the modern term of Islamophobia because the Muslim lead role was kidnapping foreign women and cutting off arms and cutting off heads and, you know, all this kind of misrepresentation of Islam. But oddly, that's not the message that I got from that film. At the end of the film, the woman that supposedly had been kidnapped and whatnot, she ended up covering. The image of her in that way, in that dress, before I started getting involved in researching Islam specifically, the person who was introducing me to Islam was encouraging me to dress more modestly. You know, instead of tight pants and short mini skirts, why not something a little looser, a little longer? Let people look upon you for who you are rather than for your body. And I thought, sure, why not? That's more comfortable. You don't really need to wear makeup either. And then one day this person says, do you have a scarf? I said, yeah, I tie them around my waist or around my neck as a type of fashion. This person says, okay, can you bring it here? And I thought, okay. There was the question, can you put it on your head? And I thought, no harm. There was just one question. So how does this feel? And my first response was different. So I thought, let me give it a try. It was winter. I could use this as an excuse. I put on a bright green scarf and I went to my world history class with a scarf on my head. And my teacher came in and he took the role and he looked at me and thought, hmm, that's different world history. He knows what a Muslim looks like. So we did the class and you know, we completed the class and then I was out of there. I thought this is an experiment. I don't want any more questions. And I went to the library to study with my friend and walked through the door. My friend was extremely happy. There is a Muslim was what he thought. I got closer. He says, wait a minute, that's Tammy. By the time we were finished studying, I had decided to start covering. Now, I didn't start covering as a Muslim should cover. I was just covering my head. I didn't realize the completeness of it at that time. I was not informed enough. So little by little, I was becoming more exposed to the concept of covering in Islam. And it was very comforting and very liberating. I had started wearing the head cover. I had some very basic knowledge of Islam. It was obvious I was ready for the next step. I was ready to take this belief on as a way of life. And fortunately, I was blessed with grasping that opportunity. I was taken to the Imam's house. I sat across from him with another person supporting me and this person presented to the Imam that I wanted to become a Muslim. And so the Imam said, okay, do you know what that is? I was eager to just declare my faith and leave because I had been told that's all that's necessary to become a Muslim. But the Imam was wiser than me. He decided to make sure that I had at least a basic understanding of what I was getting into. And so he described who Allah was and I said, yes, I'm aware of that, and he described the prophets. And then that led to the next thing, the belief in the books. And then, you know, life after death, predestination. There are some things that are written for us. Do you have that belief? And I said, yes. He says, you know, there's responsibilities that come with this. Are you ready to take on those responsibilities? The answer was yes, alhamdulillah. Hal apa yang paling mendasari ketika kamu memilih langkah terakhir untuk menjadi muslim? Actually, there was nothing that intimidated me. 
about becoming a Muslim. Some people were concerned about my safety because they had biases against Islam and tried to protect me. But everything I saw in Islam, even their opposition to it, was actually more motivation to choose it. It made me even more sure of my decision because the opposition that I saw was not based in knowledge. On the contrary, I experienced an increased surety in the decision I was making. To be honest, choosing Islam was the best decision of my life and I have never regretted it. Inshallah, I will die on this path. Inshallah, my last breath will be Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. One of the most beautiful things about that moment was that I had been informed that with this declaration of faith, my sins would be wiped away and it would be a complete fresh start. Now, I had experienced this kind of explanation in Christianity, but when I got saved in Christianity, I didn't feel that. This time I did. Bagaimana reaksi keluargamu dan orang-orang sekitar terhadap dirimu yang masuk Islam? So when I became a Muslim, like I said, there were some people who were concerned for me, and one of those was my mom. She was really worried because she didn't know what Islam was, and she was afraid that I was going to be oppressed. So she did her best to try to stop me from accepting Islam. But unfortunately, her biases towards Islam were unfounded, and fortunately, I was able to see that, so I didn't give up. Even though it brought me to tears on several occasions and once I even called my father and I said, you know, why doesn't she trust me? I'm choosing this religion because I see it as the continuation and the purification and the betterment of my beliefs. And he said, you know what, I raised you to follow the right path and if you think this is the right path, then go ahead. And finding his support was very reassuring. I didn't have difficult time with society as a whole. People were fairly understanding. Islamophobia hadn't come to its height. Mostly people were curious. And so I tried to answer their questions. And then there's the experience of going on Hajj. Pilgrimage to Mecca, it's a bit exhausting. It's physically taxing. It's in the middle of a desert, the Kaaba. That location where Abraham, peace be upon him, and his son Ishmael built the house of God, the Kaaba, called people to the worship by the order of Allah in that location. And again, that's where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received the Quran. words of God came down to the world through Archangel Gabriel to human being chosen by God, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, at that location. And I was standing there one time while waiting for the prayer. There was an Egyptian sister next to me. She's actually a Quran teacher. And then there was an Algerian sister on my left side. The Egyptian sister was reading Quran. Her voice was so beautiful. I'm listening and following along in the Quran and beauty of the words. I don't even understand them all. You know, I'm catching a word here and a word there. You know, the thought came to me, these words were revealed to my prophet here in this place, near this holy house. I'm looking around and how on earth did I, a Texan, get between an Egyptian and an Algerian? People from so many different parts of the world. And what's connecting us is not some superficial something, it's belief. It's the oneness of God. It's the love of the Prophet. It's the love of this book. It was so overwhelming, I started to cry and cry and cry. And I, I couldn't stop myself out of happiness and joy. And it was such a deep feeling. It was overwhelming and exhausting. That connection also reminded me of the fact that I'm in the midst of seeking forgiveness. I'm in the midst of truth and in the midst of attaining purification again. God is the most merciful. I don't need anyone between me and Him. I don't need any to ask from anyone but Him. And He's giving me this opportunity to come to His house and to connect with humanity, the, the humanity, the believers from the beginning of time. And to be a part of that community, it was a connection I had never experienced before. And I am so grateful for Jika kamu melihat perjalanan Nabi Muhammad, hal mana yang paling kamu kagumi? Choose the beginning when he was in the cave of Hira and Angel Gabriel came and squeezed him, telling him to read. And he saw him on the horizon and went to his wife and she told him that it was real and not a dream. It couldn't be because he was such a good person and was always good to others. Would it be that day? Or would it be the day he tried to tell his family about his son? And he called them together for a meal 
and only one child, Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, spoke up and said, yes, I'll follow you. Or would it be the day that after 25 years of beautiful marriage, his wife suffering from starvation because of the exile inflicted upon them, the believers by the unbelievers resulted in her death and how he dealt with that. Well, would it be the day that he had to leave his home, Mecca, the sacred city, because of the oppression of the disbelievers and the fact that they wanted to kill him? Or would it be the day that he traveled on a night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, rose into the heavens, and at each heaven meeting another prophet until he reached his Lord and his Lord Allah told him to pray. And then he returned with this gift of the Salah, the prayer, and the believers accepted it with joy, and the unbelievers thought he was a madman. And would it be the day when he passed away? The day that the world lost the last prophet. The angel of death asked him what he preferred, and he preferred a lot to this point. I think the day that I choose with great hope is the day that I meet him myself, inshallah, at Keftar, that blessed water that wipes away all the pain and purifies, takes away all the bad memories, and makes us ready to enter paradise, inshallah, that's the one. I have been giving speeches and doing interviews for 14 years, and this is the first time anyone has ever asked me this question. It's a beautiful question. Thank you. People. Seperti yang orang lain pikirkan, apakah hidup anda lebih membosankan setelah masuk Islam? My life after Islam became so rich. I can't describe it. The whole world opened up to me. I was a Texan, an American. I knew the tastes and the flavors and the nature of Texas. When I became a Muslim, I got to learn the flavors of Yemen and Qatar and Pakistan and Turkey. The whole world opened up to me. I got to learn about those cultures and I got to learn about those people. I got to learn about them because they are my brothers and sisters in faith. Because my creator created them too. Brought us together under the umbrella of belief. I absolutely have experienced a much richer life, a much more colorful life, a life where I can appreciate things more. Some people might think, well, okay, you were playing basketball and volleyball and running track and you were writing poetry and you were drawing and things like that. Some of these things were great. Some of them weren't so great for me. Some of them could be done in a different environment. For example, right now, I'm not comfortable with playing basketball or volleyball in public, but if I have a private place where it's just women, of course, why not? With regard to sports, um, I have developed a tremendous love for long distance walking in the forest, hiking, trekking. I have a tremendous love for archery. At the same time, I'm a confident swimmer with the right environment, do. Yeah, still lots of opportunity for living a colorful life without shortcomings of immodest attire or inappropriate environments where I can be goggled at by men. That's what I want, what's good for my soul. This life is temporary. It's the eternal that I want. Apakah setiap orang harus bergegas setelah dia menjadi muslim? Most important thing that chooses to come into Islam needs is brotherhood and sisterhood. Support. I'm not talking about financial support. Sometimes they need that too because they lose their job or their family turns their back on them or whatever because of this decision that they've made. But emotional support, definitely Allah is always there and will always be there for them. But we are creatures of community. The biggest thing a new Muslim needs is feeling like they're part of a community. So my strong encouragement is that if you know someone who's just entered into Islam, be there for them because they need you, their brother or their sister. People have asked me many times, 
in interviews and otherwise. Isn't Islam hard? Isn't it difficult? And without any hesitation, I can tell you that a life without Islam is what's hard. Our most merciful Creator has given it to us as a gift, but He hasn't forced us. He says, here it is, it's your choice. The decision is yours, the result is yours. Choose wisely.